because here's the rule with target audiences. Just because technically speaking, they could get value from you and they could like you and love you does not mean that they are actually going to buy from you. Hey, welcome to Avidly Talks. This is a mostly marketing, sales and HubSpot focused podcast. I was wondering actually as I read that out, Kate, at what stage do you stop reading an intro to a podcast? I'm getting bored of saying it. <laughs> it's your podcast. At what stage do you want to stop reading the intro to the podcast? Probably now, I think. Imagine if then I'm bored. Then just don't read it. Then don't yeah, read it. Yeah, let's do that. We're joined by Kate DeLeo, the accidental brand strategist, quote unquote, and master of the brand trifecta. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good, thank you. Good, thank you. So you a couple of weeks ago, but I saw you first time at Inbound 24. Yes. Yes, it was a ton of fun. And I was so thrilled that you were there and you came up and asked me about being on the podcast. It was fun to have you in the room as we were talking about all things brand and messaging. Mm which of course is my passion area. I liked the talk as well, because it was hands-on. So many, mm. uh, you know, presentations at conferences and stuff, they can be either slide heavy or here's an intro topic, come and find this out. So it's good when you stumble across something which is, okay, you're gonna walk out with this done. And that's what I loved about it. So <laughs> let's, let's jump in with that. So we're gonna talk about the brands uh, sorry, a brand's importance, how internal teams can get better at it, really. Yeah. So let's start with the brand trifecta that you showed me. Uh, what is it? How does it work? Sure. So let's dive in. So by the way, when we hear this word brand, I think one of the most important things that we can just kind of start with is the fact that I think a lot of times when we as leaders hear the word brand, it does sound like fluff, doesn't it? It's very mm. nebulous. It's like, oh, brand, woohoo. It's just colors. It's just a logo. But actually, I want to I want to state on the front end that my whole philosophy and my deep belief is that your brand is your path of least resistance to revenue. And what I mean by that is it's your ability, your organization's ability to really set forth a promise that says, ultimately, this is what we do, this is how we solve our customers' problems, and this is how we're different and better than the rest. And so when we think about this logically, that is the stuff that our customers, our target audiences ultimately want to know from us to take the next step and buy. That's brand. Brand is really that conduit that allows customers to opt in, to self-select, and to take the next step with us. That's the goal. And so brand trifecta is a method that I teach, very simple formulaic approach, Paul, of how in the world do you boil that down and write that and build that in such a way based on buyer psychology that you can deliver the one, two, three punch, as I always say, that allows people to get there in 30 seconds or less. That's the goal with the brand trifecta. Where did the framework come from? Do you know what? I honestly fell upon this in my early sales career, which is probably the best way, right? It's not like I was reading books in a basement deciding, ah, oh, yes, I want to be a brand strategist with my life. Um, you know, I fell into this in a sales how do you, career. How do you explain <laughs> that to your parents? I, I struggle explaining marketing. How... <laughs> well, do you know what the story was is, and this is, gets back to the title of accidental brand strategist. Um, I shared this story when I, when I was speaking at Inbound, but if we rewind back to 2008, at the time I was in college, I was planning to pursue my PhD in linguistic anthropology which is really the study of how language shapes culture and how culture shapes language. So I was a total language nerd. Okay, so here I am, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I'm like, oh yes, I'm gonna be professor. And the market crashes here in the United States. And you know, I had a professor tell me, he's like, there is no way you're gonna have a job coming out of another seven years of PhD work. And I was like, well, that's honest. Thank you so much. <laughs> And he said, I honestly think that you should leave academia Ouch. and get a job. <laughs> Normally, advice. it's stay in academia if you, as long as you can. Do, contribute knowledge. No, that's quite the practical. Well, but you know, you think about the cost in the United States, right? So you think about the pure, sheer cost of what it takes to even for us to pay for undergraduate degree and then higher education. I mean, it would have been coming out of both undergraduate and graduate with more than $200,000 in debt. Wow. Um, and so when you think about that number, 
right? And he, he basically looked at me and he said, I just don't think that this is a smart choice for you. Um, so he recommended, you know, yeah, you need to go get a job, maybe come back in a little bit once you have some real world experience and, you know, we'll still be here. He is still teaching there, by the way, which is so funny. Uh, I stay connected with him. But it's funny, I was living at home at the time and my Italian father was like, this is a great idea. I love this professor. Please get a job and leave our house. We love you so much, but it's time to go. Um, so Paul, long story short, I started my career in sales. I had to cold call people. I had to sell them IT training classes and it was in that job that I had to trial and error and stumble upon this formula of how to keep somebody on the phone in that first 30 seconds to compel them to want to purchase a $2,500 training class. And mm. I didn't know it was brand. I had to fight my way through this, like a lot of us in cold calling. And I spent the next 15 years of my career recognizing and refining, and wow, the power of brand. And now teaching this to sales leaders, marketing leaders, C-suite leaders. You keep, the topic keeps reminding me of a post I've just had shared with me by Josephine, who edits the podcast. Who's, uh, who's in the same team as me, she's hosting some of the episodes. A post going around LinkedIn at the minute about how brands need to be more interested in the vibe than ever, and how on TikTok with disposable content, it's not even disposable, like two seconds clusters of view, mm -hmm. you've got to have the overall vibe of your brand right. That's right. Yeah, I just, this, method you've got is more con well it's more controlled and structured than just feelings which a lot it of is. us think about as brand isn't it like you say it's so wishy-washy or abstract to a lot of people but this is yeah, a great way of making that. it tangible this uh, the trifecta yeah i think vibe is important per se now by the mm -hmm. way i want to call out a few pieces here so first of all when, when I'm building a brand with a client, let's say, we do start with things that we would call quote unquote vibe, which gets into things like your brand personality, your tone of voice, your archetypes. These are things that capture how your brand shows up authentically in the world today. In other words, how does somebody experience your brand? Are you corporate and cold? Are you bright and boisterous? Are you young and hip and cool? Or are you a bit more conservative? And there's no right or wrong answer here, but you need to know authentically how you sh show up in the world as an organization, or if it's a personal brand, how your personal brand is, because brand is not aspirational. In other words, people can smell a mile away if you're mm. trying to be something that you're not. So you have to first know who you are here and now and brand for who you are here and now before you write the message, okay? So that's the first piece. But I think outside of vibe, you do need a message that authentically resonates at a heart level, and that's where brand trifecta comes in, comes into play, is you do need walk, a message walk, that's actually gonna connect. Walk us through the trifecta then. You said it's a three-punch three, three mm -hmm. punch combo. Yeah, it's a three-punch combo. So really, the three core components that any brand needs to have are this. Number one, a tagline that clearly articulates, this is what we do. Followed by number two, a value proposition statement, which expands on your tagline. And a value proposition statement really addresses, here's the heart pain you are facing, and here's how we can solve that pain for you. And then finally, the third component of your brand trifecta are what we call a set of differentiator statements. And as the name implies, this is like the three to five big bullet points, Paul, kind of that macro level, if you assume that global level of how you are different and better than your competition. So keep in mind, not all the features and benefits you may have, not all the 35 things you do, but Apples to apples, if somebody compared you against why they should buy from you versus a competitor, what are those three to five ways that you think you're different and yes, better than the competition? So tagline, what you do, value proposition statement, how you solve your customer's problem, differentiator statements, how you are different and better than the competition. What do you need to know before diving in and doing this? I remember you taking us through it mm -hmm. and you, you don't do it just from top to bottom, do you? Yeah, it's interesting. The first, outside of knowing you, the first most important thing that you really need to understand is who are you going after and why? So this is interesting because I think a lot of us come in with really strong, very good assumptions for our business or our organization to say, listen, 
we traditionally served groups A and B. Okay, great. And yet, Kate, we want to expand in the market. We want to expand our market share, and we now want to go after this new audience. Let me give you an example. Kate, we traditionally served women between the ages of 30 and 45, but we now think, Kate, that we should serve 20 to 30-year-olds. Ah, interesting. So you've made up in your mind, let's say, a new category, or Kate, we've always gone for healthcare companies and services companies, but now we've decided we're going to go for manufacturing companies. Ah, okay, great. So whatever this looks like for you, you have in your mind target audiences, ICP, whatever you want to call it. And in your mind, you've decided with that category, the, the right details in terms of size, sector, could be employee count, it could be roles in that side of that. But what you must understand are who are the humans behind those categories. In other words, how do those people think, act, behave? What's the level of bureaucracy in the organization? What are their decision-making styles? How big is their burning platform and need for what you have? Because here's the rule with target audiences. Just because technically speaking, they could get value from you and they could like you and love you does not mean that they are actually going to buy from you. So your job is to brand for the few, the one or two, maybe three audiences who actually have the highest level of pain and who have the money and are willing to purchase here and now. And recognize that you may have what we call outlier audiences, by the way, Paul. They know you, they like you, they love you, they came from you from a referral, maybe you previously sold to them. And you're not going to just shove them away, they're great buyers, but are you going to actively message and market to them? No, you let them come to you. How do you find that, um, you know, it sounds like you're identifying your repeatable Correct. customer. How do, you, how do you find that or how do you advise people find it? What do they need to do? Well, I think there's a few areas that you can pull from in order to do this. I think first and foremost, um, you can do market research. If you're somebody that really relies on the data, you absolutely can go do market research, whether that's formal market research with a firm, or you can go out and do anecdotal market research. You also can go study what your competitors are doing. Mm. I've had plenty of people before they come to me, they go look at what the competitors are doing. Good. You also need to go look at your own customer base. What, what's your win-loss ratio? Why did you lose those customers? Do you know why you didn't win the deal? Do you know that? Why did they go to a competitor versus you? Have you ever surveyed people and asked why? Mm -hmm. Why did two customers choose you over the competitor? Are you surveying your customers to know that? Ooh, that's interesting. Um, the next thing is understanding too, who do you really want to serve? So once you have quote unquote hard data, the next thing is choice. And this, I think, Founders and leaders need to understand this too. With brand, you do have choice in the mix. You have revenue potential. And one of the things is that you do have the opportunity to say, who do we actually want to serve that we think could be the lowest hanging fruit to drive those revenue metrics? Hmm. Where do we want to take this company? Yes, yeah, so you need, have you need ever to ask know yourself themselves. that. Yeah, yeah. You, companies need to know themselves as, as much as they need to know their customers, I guess. For example, have you ever had the worst customer ever? Mm -hmm. No comment. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what? Uh-huh. And one of the things that I love to have my clients do is paint the picture in their mind of the worst customer, and then we reverse it. And I say, okay, so congratulations. You have choice. You don't have to serve those people anymore. Mm. But Kate, if I don't serve them, then I'm leaving money on the table. Well, hang on. How much fear are you standing in right now that you're so worried about serving wrong customers that are sucking away your time and your energy and your power and your resources and killing your bottom line and your people that you're missing out actually on the energy that you could have put towards getting a right fit customer that said yes faster, that loves you, that made a faster decision, that referred friends and so on and so forth. We've got to lead from a place of invitation and not desperation. And so choice with who we go after is paramount if we're going to build a brand that drives revenue, period. It's a very powerful uh, statement as well to be targeting somebody so narrowly and sort of saying no to people. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I think companies need to stay strong in my experience as well when they do this and have the nerve to actually narrow it down. 
Yeah. It has some sort of reverse psychological effect to a lot of your bad fit customers. It of, does. Actually, no, I do want to work with you. And then, do you ever see companies sort of buckling and going, okay, go on then, and then you're still taking on these bad fit deals? Yes. And then I come knocking on their door because they call me exhausted. <laughs> and they wonder why their brand's not working. And I said, well, are you actually staying true to what you wrote? Well, the message is out there, Kate. I'm like, well, are you delivering on that? Well, hmm. Back to the trifecta. So you go, you, you know your uh, audience, you know what you want or who you serve best. I'm interested maybe on the tagline part uh, of how companies or teams can do this. How, how do you, where do you see people falling down on, on putting these things together? What's the mm. common sort of mistakes? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, it's funny when you were in the room, I'm sure that you saw that I always, I gave this advice. I said, you know, have you ever tried to write a tagline before and 17 weeks later and 35 taglines later, you don't have a tagline and everybody laughed. And I said, well, you know, it's fascinating because in, in the world of language, now let's talk language for a second here. Um, if we recognize that this brand trifecta concept of a tagline being at the tip top of this content hierarchy, tagline, value proposition statement, differentiators, you want to imagine your tagline is kind of like the top of the, the pyramid, the icing on the cake. And so it's actually the last thing that you're going to write. It becomes the oh, duh, at the very end of this process. And so you want to leave your tagline as the very last bit because a tagline is very short. It's snappy. It's only five or six words. It's rhythmic. It's got to work with your, your name of your company. It's got to work with the value proposition statement. There can't be any repetitive words or language or phrasing whatsoever. It's very provocative, which culturally is hard. I live in Minnesota, land of passive aggressive. We're not supposed to be confident. We're not supposed to talk about ourselves. And I don't mean being cocky. I don't mean being pretentious here, but again, the art of provocation, which is getting an emotional response from somebody. So tagline, the biggest things that I see companies do wrong is they try to just write a tagline in a box somewhere. The other thing is they neglect the rest of the messaging. So you can't just write a tagline without looking at the rest of your messaging. The second thing is, is they write a tagline using the words we and our, they write a tagline that's super long and all of a sudden it becomes a sentence and then it just loses everything. Have you got a and good, a good example that comes to mind that doesn't do those things you just said? Well, so let me give you an example. If, if, I, I always give the, I give the silliest example of a company that does tax services, which is the least sexy <laughs> services offering. Now, if there's anybody listening that does tax services, I love you. I'm here for you. But tax is not exactly what we think of like cool and flashy, right? But imagine having a tagline for a company and all you do is you serve small businesses with tax services. Okay. Now, imagine my tagline were simply small business tax services that work or something like that. Is, is that very, it says what you do, but is that very provocative? Mm. Not, not really. Instead, no. what if my tagline were making tax compliance effortless? The, um, the, the, they don't do it anymore, but when they had a big campaign, I think it was when they made doing your tax digital here in the UK. It was tax doesn't have to be taxing, which I thought was very good. I've always liked exactly. that. Exactly. Tax doesn't have to be taxing. And that's a really good pain statement that really gets the heart of how people feel about it. Great taglines are provocative and they do get the, ooh, what do you mean by that? Ooh, which is what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. It leads you to the value proposition statement, exactly. You're spot on, Paul. So I think that's the biggest thing is be provocative. Don't be scared to come out and really speak to how great you are and what you do right away. Don't hide behind it. You know, if anything, your tagline does need to be bold. Otherwise, you're missing the mark here to bring people in to your greatness. You talked about um, coming from the land of being passive aggressive. Mm. Is that what Minnesotans are known for? Yes, absolutely. And here I am a type A East Coast Italian, so I clearly don't belong where I live. Uh. <laughs> we, um, we run into that avidly with um, sort of cross-country teams and 
you've got the language differentiators, but then mm. strong cultural differences. So yeah, sure. very much, I guess, in the US, I don't know, comparing Silicon Valley to... Absolutely. Yeah. East Coast to Midwest to yeah, South. Yeah, exactly. Cultural differences, always you're going to run into that when writing language as well. Mm -hmm. So this framework, the trifecta framework, this three-punch combo, tagline, value, proposition, statement, your differentiators... What I like is about the other places you can use this. It's not just for your grand company tagline. Where else do you deploy this brand trifecta? Yeah, absolutely. So brand trifecta is a formula that you can actually use in like a layered brand architecture. So let me explain what I mean by that. First and foremost, if you're a smaller organization, you're like, well, Kate, we really just offer a couple set of services and we only have a couple target audiences and we kind of solve the same thing. Same pain for everybody. Okay, well, imagine your brand trifecta being your homepage language on your website, front and center. This is what we do. This is how we solve your problem. This is how we're different. Congratulations. You'll probably have a services page and you're probably going to have a great offerings page and away you go. Okay, now, if your organization is more complex, you might have multiple sectors you serve. Maybe perhaps you off have multiple product offerings that are quite different that serve very specific needs. This is where you can create what we call layered architecture, where actually you can create supporting brand trifectas for various target audiences, like sector specific, and then even going down a layer to be product or service specific. It's wonderful because what you can do is start to create, again, that pyramid of brand trifectas going down, just as you would create a sitemap or a structure on a website, the same rule applies that you can create these brand trifectas based on page structure and on audience structure so that when each audience hits their respective appropriate landing page, they have a message that tells them, what do you do for me? What yeah. problem do you solve for me? And how are you different that I care about? So the formula works down to a granular level. All of these can be tied into the same tone of voice and consistency. And a final note, Paul, is if your organization is a house of brands or a branded house, the brand trifecta formula still works. So when I work with enterprise level companies, doesn't matter if you're a branded house and you're, you know, um, in one sit or you're a Procter and Gamble and you're a house of brands. If you are selling consumer based products or you are selling B2B services or SaaS, the formula still works. How do you approach it uh, in terms of, it's like working from the bottom up, I guess, well, but from memory, it was the middle outwards we did it yes. in your exercise, wasn't it? So how do, just give us a, a, obviously you can't, in the 10 minutes or so we've got left, you can't give us the whole exercise, but you start with the value proposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yes. talk us through it from there. What I recommend that you do is start with your value proposition statement. Now, a strong value proposition statement and by the way, there's like five or six core structures in the English language, and I'm not going to bore you to tears on this. And I, there's six structures of a tagline in the English language and so on and so forth. Okay, but let's talk about nuts and bolts here. In the English language, the, the primary structure of a value proposition statement consists of two sentences. Okay, sentence number one is what we call a pain statement. And the pain statement, imagine filling in the blank of the reality is dot, 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 blank. So Think use your my... use your accountant one again. There we go. Use the tax example. The reality is dot dot dot. Tax, tax is a major is priority for your business, yeah. but it should not be a major part of your day. So what's that structure? Ooh. That's the reality is dot dot dot. Tax is a major priority for your business, but it should not be a major part of your day. The second sentence that follows it up then is what we call a call to action statement which by the way, a call to action statement is really phrased, and you see this all the time, do this so you get that. Like partner with the premier firm that enables you to da 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 da. So a call to action in this situation for this tax firm would be, therefore protect your credibility, relationships and profits with worry-free tax consulting. So listen as I pull it together. Tax is a major priority for your business, but it should not be a major part of your day. Protect your credibility, relationships, and profits with worry-free tax consulting. It's short, it's to the point, but it really speaks to the pain that somebody's facing and what they need to do to solve that pain. 
you're automatically thinking then, okay, well, what makes, why should I read your services, Kate? Why should I see what you do about it, aren't you? So that's where your differentiation statements that's right. come in. Yeah? That's right. You gave them a compelling promise, but psychologically that person's going, oof, that's really interesting, but wait a second. Are you like that other tax firm that I've heard of? I think I've heard that before. Is this, well, I, I need to make sure I'm understanding you. Now, by the mm. way, this is good. I want to call this out. Differentiator statements are important. Most brands do a good job of having some sort of a value proposition statement, but they jump all of them automatically into their offering. And you cannot miss differentiator statements because when you deliver a provocative tagline and a compelling value proposition statement, the brain is taking in new, compelling, very important information, and it needs to make sense of that information before it's ready to hear about your actual offerings yet. So in order for that brain to make sense of this new and compelling information, like my amazing you know, promise mm. of protect your credibility, do you know what it does? It makes a comparison. Paul, you just heard mm. me tell you this, but your brain's trying to make sense of what I just told you. So your brain's going to compare me to the competition. Brains compartmentalize against a category that it already has. In other words, you're going to go, is Kate like that other tax services company I heard about in the UK? Tax doesn't mm. have to be taxing. Ooh, here we go. So you might ask me a question like, Kate, are you like H&R Block? We have that in the United States. Um, are you like this other tax company? And I go, oh my gosh, such a great question. I'm a little different. Here's how. And then I can list quickly my big bullets. I only focus on small businesses, Paul. We're available 24-7 mm -hmm. for responsivity. We dig in and investigate any problem without charging you by the hour, and so on and so forth. And so immediately I clear up that noise. And it's only once I deliver the differentiators that finally you come to the conversion or the opt-in moment when you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense, Kate. So now, all right. So Kate, how does that work? What does that look like? I how hope this is coming together because again, I'm visualizing it. Like when you first walked me through it, sort of, yes, that works on a homepage to book a meeting or download your prices or whatever. Mm -hmm. It works on a landing page for a webinar whatever the next step is big or small right. that, that framework then works doesn't it it does you mentioned that people jump into the tagline uh that's one of the common things where it falls down is there any other tips for people trying to follow this sort of yeah structured approach don't forget your differentiators and do not switch the order you cannot mm. on a website for example go from tagline value proposition statement into the logos you've worked with and then a slider banner because it's pretty of testimonials stop it you're leading people down trails they are not ready to go down yet honestly watch the layout of your page watch the layout of the structure imagine you were having a conversation would you stop mid-conversation to talk about who you've worked with no you <laughs> wouldn't would you hmm. so follow the flow of the conversation this is logic train of thought here let them go down this path with you and if you follow that logic and then put the cool logos you've worked with and then the amazing slider and explainer videos and all the other stuff. You're allowing that person to come to their conclusion on their own quickly where they're ready to dive in and go, okay, now I want to know details and pricing and how it works. Oh my gosh, I'm ready to book that meeting and get on that discovery call. And here's the best part, Paul. By the time they get on that call with you, they're a higher quality prospect because they're no longer asking you what what you do. They already know it. One of the one of the most common uh, differentiators that over the years every customer said it to us. It's their customer service that sets them apart at the end of the day. <laughs> so where does that fit in in your in your view? Uh, I know, isn't that funny? I, we laughed about this when you were in my room at, at Inbound. Um, everybody says it's our people our people make us better mm. okay so listen i'm sure you have amazing people but differentiators are about more than that what i want you to be thinking about are things like proprietary approach or process speed to delivery level of efficiency i wouldn't say price because i don't think you want to be in a price war with a competitor but perhaps it is um 
type of partnership. Maybe it's white glove service that you offer. Maybe you spin that a little differently, like it's 24 seven support. Maybe that's Depends on your you industry and what you do, doesn't it? Yeah. It's... Right. So maybe talk about the level of support versus our people are really nice, right? So yeah. what can you talk about that feels a bit more tangible than, than just simply saying, you know, our people are really great and we care. I'm sure they do. That's why you hired them. But isn't that why everybody hires their people? So yeah. we want you to move up a level from that to something that your customers can get their arms around and it feels tangible value. So just before we finish, we come in, everybody will be in new year planning at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, how can you spot that it's like new year, new brand time when, when you're an in-house team, say? What are the clues? When it's new year, new brand time? Yeah. Oh, here's what I would tell you is if you're really on the fence, like, do we even need to think about this right now for our business? Is this a priority? I think the things that you want to listen for, the symptoms that you as a leader should be thinking about are as follows. One, we're struggling to get prospects to the table. It's taking longer and longer. Our sales cycle, by the way, is getting longer and longer. Ooh, we're struggling to even close deals. Kate, the people that we close, they're not even right fit clients. Um, then all of a sudden you start to hear things like, People are canceling us. We're not maintaining subscribers or we're not getting the same level of referrals. Our revenue is down. All of these are symptoms that not that there's a sales issue, but that there's a brand pitch issue. There's a brand issue of who you're going after and how you're showing up in the world and the message you're delivering to those people. And so it's not about reinventing yourself. I want you to have permission to recognize this is not about a rebrand. 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, what we're talking about is a quarter turn of your message. It's the tightening of the bolt. Take what you're doing well, focus on building a brand trifecta to really create the structure you need in your language, tighten that message up and create the architecture, make some core decisions that you need to for your organization and really allow that to serve you well. That is what's gonna do justice so that you have a brand that is the path of least resistance to revenue. Amazing. So give us as a reminder, tagline, come on, run us through it one more time. Value proposition statement and differentiator statements. That is the brand trifecta. And if you can build those three things and deploy them in that order, you will see a direct impact on customer acquisition and revenue. And this works on homepage, structure of a sales presentation, I imagine. Proposals, slide decks, one page sales sheets, uh, elevator pitches, in person dialogue, sales Service calls, pages, landing, everything. Web, landing page, yeah. What's, uh, okay, where can people go to get some resources from you? Maybe, do you have any worksheets yeah, or? You know, if you have any questions about this and you're curious to learn more information about this concept, you can certainly take a look at my website which is www.katedeleo.com. I think Paul will go ahead and put that in the show notes so you can take a look there. Okay. And you also can connect with me on LinkedIn. I Feel free to send me a message. I respond to those too. So if you were listening today, you have a question about your brand, don't hesitate to reach out as well. Kate DeLeo, I'm also on LinkedIn. Those are the two best ways to find me. Nice and simple. Like the brand trifecta, I like it. Cool. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kate. I know you're super busy. I um, appreciate you coming on, sharing that framework. So everybody, get together your differentiated statements, think of your value proposition, and then start putting your tagline together and deploy those things in the other order. Tagline first, hook people in. Value proposition of what makes you different as a, uh, the value you bring, and then you differentiate statements to show how you actually do it different. I think that was key from what you said for me. Mm -hmm. It's not your customer testimonials being five stars. Everybody's got that. It's not your people. Everybody's got good people. It's more tangible. It's the right. nuts and bolts of what you actually deliver, what you do faster, what you do better. So thank you. Um, we'll put the link in, like you say, katedeleo.com or head to LinkedIn. We'll include the link for that as well. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to leave us a comment on Spotify or a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts and hit the follow button not to miss future episodes. We'll see you next time. And thanks, Kate. Hope to see you again. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Have a lovely day. See you later. Thank you. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? Then be sure to leave us a comment, a review, 
and hit that follow button. See you next episode.